absolutely. So, uh, good afternoon, uh, or well, good afternoon from Athens, I should say, or indeed good morning, or uh, good evening, uh, depending on where you are. Uh, my name is Aris Sintetos. I'm a research professor at Cardiff University, and um, well, it is the greatest pleasure, it is an immense honor to introduce the first keynote address of the 2021 International Symposium of Forecasting. I am delighted that today Professor Gerd Gigerenger will be speaking to us about psychological AI. Uh, after the speech, there will be the opportunity for some questions. And during the Q&A, uh, you'll be able to raise your hand if you wish to ask a question or type the question in the Q&A box. Please note in the Q&A box, not the chat box. So many thanks to Professor Gidger Enzer for joining us today. Of course, as forecasters, I guess, or more generally as scientists, we are all familiar with uh, Professor Gidger Enzer and his work. Uh, so in many ways, he doesn't need introduction at all, but let me just offer some uh, comments. Uh, Professor Gidger Enzer has served at the faculty of various universities, including the University of Chicago, before leaving the Center for Adaptive Behavior and Cognition at the Max Planck Institute for Human Development in Berlin. Uh, I have actually had the immense pleasure to visit the Institute in Berlin myself some years back. Well, time goes quickly. Uh, and have experienced firsthand the truly remarkable interdisciplinary approach that he has, he has established to the study of decision making. Uh, indeed, Professor Giger Enger uh, brought together uh, uh, various disciplines psychology, uh, philosophy, history, uh, biology, economics certainly mathematics and statistics, and of course, more recently, machine learning to the study of uh, decision making. And he helped us uh, much as few to integrate the description of uh, human behavior with prescription uh, for, for improved decision making. Uh, he proposed and established across many of the disciplines I have just mentioned, the revolutionary theory of fast and frugal heuristics, uh, which is a very strong alternative to the reigning heuristics and biases theory in the descriptive sciences and the big data optimization in the prescriptive sciences. Uh, as such, Professor uh, Giger Enger and his team have built a, a theory fit for practice, and this is very much reflected in the highly successful startup Simply Rational, which has had an immense impact on business, medicine, law, and government. He has been awarded numerous honorary doctorships, fellowships, and academic prizes, and his uh, award-winning popular books uh, calculated risks, uh, gut feelings, and risk savvy have been translated into more than 20 languages. Uh, his highly influential academic books include uh, Simple Heuristics, uh, that makes us smart, Rationality for Mortals, Simply Rational, and Bounded Rationality, uh, which was co-authored with a, a Nobel laureate, uh, uh, Raymond Selby. Currently, he's part of, he's part of uh, Simply Rational, uh, uh, director of the Harding Center for Risk Literacy at the University of Potsdam, and director emeritus of the Max Planck Institute for Human Development in Berlin. So, uh, without further ado, it is my greatest pleasure and it's truly my greatest honor to welcome the first keynote speaker of the 2021 International Symposium of Forecasting, Professor Gerd Gigerenzer. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Aris. Can you see the slides? Absolutely, yeah. yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, how to make good forecasts? I will talk today about two big visions. One is there's a complex problem, find a complex solution. The other one is make everything as simple as possible, but not simpler. Uh, and I will introduce you into a particular version of this second approach, uh, namely psychological AI. That means not just prune a decision tree or a regression analysis, but start from the beginning with simple heuristics and test them how well they predict. Specifically, uh, I will talk about the following issues. First, the stable world principle. That principle says complex models, that me by that I mean models with lots of parameters that need to be estimated, are likely to predict well in stable situations while simple models are likely to predict well in uncertain 
dynamic situations. This is a very important point because the issue is not whether complex models are better than simple ones or simple better than complex ones, but the issue is in what situation does it pay to design a really complex models and where you shouldn't do that because you overfit, because you actually predict less well. So the stable world principle is a more general principle. For instance, the big successes of AI, big data are in stable worlds. So chess, go. And the more humans have a role, the more uncertain the situation is, the less well is the power of highly complex big data analytic models. I will give you a few examples in a minute. So that's the first principle. The second, uh, the bias variance dilemma is well known from machine learning and it gives one a quite general idea about why it can pay to make a model simple as opposed to complex. And the key intuition is that a simple model, particular models that have no free parameters, they have no error from variance. That is, they don't overfit the past while they may have a higher bias. And I will go a little bit into the details today to uh, explain that. Psychological AI is the idea to derive uh, simple models from human psychology. And that is different from traditional approaches to, uh, <clears throat> uh, to, the, uh, to simple models, which just start with a complex model and make it step-by-step step simpler. The uh, psychological AI is also the, the original meaning of artificial intelligence as uh, in the sense of Herbert Simon, where the I refers to human intelligence. So the idea is to uh, analyze human intelligence that has been evolved over millennia. And then, uh, and then use that and program a computer so that computers can make better decisions. And the point I will make, that uh, psychological AI was not successful as Herbert Simon originally thought in playing chess and other well-defined games, but it is much more successful in uncertain dynamic situations that is, situations that are not well defined. And the human brain evolved not to deal with stable situations or situations of calculable risk, but with uncertainty. And at the end, I also will deal with two uh, values. So first, we have a faith in complexity and opacity, particularly reinforced by the advance of uh, big data and machine learning. Machine learning is wonderful, the more stable a situation is. Hmm? But there's the mistaken belief that the most accurate forecasting models must be always inherently incomprehensible. And you will see in this symposium that some people share this idea. Hmm? And finally, there is a value in transparency. We are moving into a world that it's more and more populated by algorithms and where uh, people often do not understand how an algorithm makes a recommendation or a judgment. And that is particularly critical in, in court situation uh, in predictions of recidivism, where we know that the co most complex models 
don't do any better than models that just lose two or three variables such as age or number of uh, previous convictions. And simplicity enables transparency. That doesn't mean that a simple models are always uh, good, but we should, in any case, always look whether a complex model actually does better than a simple one. And also not just value a tiny amount of better accuracy over other values that includes transparency and also the ability of practitioners to revise such a model and to understand it. So that's the program. Are you ready? Then we'll start. I'll start with one example of high uncertainty. So how to forecast the spread of the flu? As you all know, uh, Google flu trends, a form of big data analytics, tried to predict the flu related doctor visits and was based on an analysis of some 50 million search terms trained on data from 2003 to 2007 and tested in the following year. The first version used 45 variables uh, and when they failed to predict the outbreak of the swine flu in 2009, then it's interesting how the Google engineers reacted. So given the stable world principle, we have to do, we have to deal here with a world that is not highly stable. The flu changes, the virus changes, and the behavior of people who put in search terms changes. And they're not only putting in search terms because they feel sick, but also because they may feel curious. So the Google engineers, when their algorithm failed, followed the principle, if a complex algorithm fails, what do you do? You make it more complex. The stable world principle suggests the opposite, make it simpler. So uh, we uh, used a psychological AI approach. So you start not with 50 million search terms and big data, but with the wisdom that human psychology has evolved. And we know from psychological research that dates back to Brown's law of recency that in dynamic uncertain situations, people do not rely on the entry history of things that I know, but only on the very few last uh, data points in order to make decisions. So we formulated the recency heuristic, which is the extreme version, which just takes the most recent data point. It's also the opposite of big data because it uses only one data and deliberately discards everything else. Precisely, the heuristic says, predict that this week's proportion of flu-related doctor visits equals the proportion of the most recent past week. That's immensely simple. It has no free parameter. So we uh, tested Google flu trends against the recency heuristic for the entire time where Google flu trends made predictions. So what do you think is the result? Can one data point be at least approximately as good as a big data analytics method whose details we never uh, learn because it's secret as many of these algorithms are. That's another issue. So here's the result. What do you see 
on the, on the y-axis is the percentage of flu-related doctor visits. And that is on average, something like in the order of two, uh, percentage of all doctor visits are flu-related. And on the uh, x-axis, these are the years from 2007 to 2016. The observed uh, flu-related doctor visits are black. The predictions of the recency heuristic are blue, and the red ones are Google flu trends. So let's start with Google flu trends. So this is the red curve. Uh, it does very well, and it goes a little bit low here in the early 2008. And then it does fairly well until uh, the uh, <clears throat> this spring and summer of 2009. What happened? Swine flu. Big data has learned that the flu is high in the winter and low in the summer. So it predicted low and had problems to get back. At this point, the Google flu engineers, the Google engineers uh, updated the algorithm and from 45 predictors to 160 to make it more complex. And what you can see here, there were more updates, all of them secret. Here's a period where Google Fruit Trends really overestimated the uh, doctor visits and here it was terminated. If you look at the mean absolute error in percentage points, Google Fruit Trends had 0.38, so that's the value on here. And the reason the heuristic had only about half of the error. So what we have here is a less is more effect. And also uh, an illustration of the power of psychological AI. You use a simple heuristic that people rely on in dynamic situations. We also know from experiments that people do not use these heuristics in discriminately, and we uh, model it and use it as a forecasting algorithm and we test it. And in this case, one data point does better than uh, yeah, big data. I also want to emphasize at this point that the recency heuristic relying on the most recent thing that happened to you is also in parts of psychology be misinterpreted as something that does wrong. It's sometimes called availability, although availability has many, many meanings. And here we have an illustration that every heuristic uh, can work under certain situations while in the others it will fail, exactly just like uh, the uh, big data algorithms will work in certain problems, but not in others. And that's the main message uh, in the study of what I call ecological rationality. That means figure out what are the situations where a given model or algorithm or heuristic will work well and where not. And the stable world principle gives you a general idea. If it's a stable problem, make it complex. If it's not like predicting the flu, keep your fingers on and try to make it simple. So it has been said that science can learn from Google. Here's an example where Google can learn from science. The same thing uh, is just coming out uh, by predicting the incidence of COVID-19. Uh, I'll make this very short. The, there is the Austrian government as a forecast consortium that uses highly complex epidemiology COVID-19 models to forecast the weekly seven-day incidence rates and also hospitalizations. Here are just some ideas what exactly is it all gone. It's going on. The point is that once again, these authors with the highly complex models 
did not compare these models with any simple heuristic. And according to a recent analysis, uh, another form of the recency heuristic actually appears to predict better. That's not my own research. And this is now, uh, uh, you can find more in the reference. That recency heuristic doesn't take the last point, but the last change. So it predicts that next week's trend will be the same as last week. Uh, meanwhile, we uh, know that these type of results, that quite simple heuristics can be highly efficient in forecasting under dynamic, uh, in situations of dynamic change, change of uh, imperfect information of structural breaks are beginning to be taken serious, even in macroeconomics. And here is a paper I just put up here. I recommend you, if you are curious to read it, by Giovanni Dosi, Mauro Napolitani, Andrea Roventini, Joseph Stiglitz, a Nobel laureate in economics, and Tanya Treibich. And they have looked at with agent-based models at highly complex macroeconomic situations where typically uh, standard probability models are being used. Uh, and they found by comparing uh, complex models with very simple so-called myopic expectations. Um, and they find, I read, our results suggest that fast and frugal robust heuristics may not be a second best option, but rather rational responses in complex and changing macroeconomic environments. And the heuristic they found most successful is very similar to the recency heuristic you've just seen. So the big methodological message is always compare your complex models to simple heuristics not to other complex models. And particular under uncertainty. And if we have a model that's transparent, that's simple and actually better than highly complex models, then we should use this one. Unless we want to sell our complex models to people who do not understand the stable world principle. So I'll follow with a second example with a different type of heuristic. So this situation is, assume you have a large company and a customer basis with hundred thousands of customers and you want to predict which of your customers will buy in the future. So that is an important decision that every business has been faced. You don't want to waste your time and effort to contact people who will never buy again. And again, it's a problem under high uncertainty. It's not a problem where you can use your yeah, calculated risk models. Nevertheless, marketing science relies again on highly complicated um, risk models. Here's just one, uh, the Pareto negative binomial distribution model. I'm not going into any details. Um, I just hope you'll be impressed by looking at the equations. The psychological AI has a different approach. It doesn't try to impress you with complicated models, but it would start with the experience managers and study them how they make that type of decisions based on years of experience. And in the study I show you, and I chose it because the two authors, Wipp and Wangenheim, were convinced that managers should use the Pareto negative binary distribution model or similar complex models. After they found out that managers actually don't use that, but rely on a simple heuristic. 
The heuristic is called the hiatus heuristic. If a customer hasn't purchased within nine months, classify as inactive, otherwise as active. The hiatus nine months can change from business to business, but that's in the study was the typical one being found. And then the authors did the right thing to do, to test competitively complex model versus simple models and test them in prediction, not in data fitting. In data fitting, complex models with lots of free parameters always win, but that doesn't mean that they predict better. Here's the result. There were three companies, an airline, an apparel, and a CD. Now, the correct predictions are on the y-axis. In the airline, the Pareto negative binomial distribution model got 74% correct. The simple heuristic, 77. Note that the Pareto model has all the information the heuristic has and does more com uh, computation, but still predicts less. That's called a less is more effect. In the upper rail, we have the same situation. The Pareto negative binomial distribution model does 75. The simple heuristic that uses only one data point, 83. And uh, in the uh, CD now business, both are the same, and you just save all the effort buying and using these complicated models. The reaction to this study was that the two authors convinced themselves, but they didn't convince all of their colleagues. So they, couldn't it be that uh, these three businesses are an exception? Couldn't it be that the Pareto negative binomial distribution model isn't as good as it was? What about powerful machine learning techniques? And uh, so we uh, got together and replicated and tested the same situation with 24 businesses and used uh, not only Pareto negative binomial distribution, but uh, random forests, one of the most powerful machine learning technique, and also logistic regression, a standard model that is always powerful. And the, what do you think is the result? Now we are dealing with 24 businesses with heavyweight competitors. If you look at the left side of this picture, you see the result. That's the average across 24 companies. The Pareto negative binomial uh, distribution model still does not so good as the hiatus heuristic. There is another one that does even worse. Logistic regression performs better than that. And so do random forests, but none of them can outperform the simple hiatus heuristic that just relies on one data point. We also have tested a number of other repeat uh, forecasting problems, such as whether a patient who has been released from a hospital will return within 24 hours, or whether certain weather events will return, and so on. And we find, interesting, the same situation again. And relying on one powerful cue is on average, leads to, leads on average to more accurate predictions than doing random forest and logistic regression or other models with more cues. And I turn now to the real important questions. Can we explain when that happens and when it does not happen? And I'll provide to you a simple intuitive proof. And uh, this is about a situation where we compare a one reason heuristic, and you've seen two versions, the recency and the hiatus heuristic, but any class of uh, heuristics that just 
use one Q. And the Q is not arbitrary. In both of the cases, it is informed by psychological theory or by experience managers. And this type of question is a question of ecological rationality. It means the match between a certain strategy and the environment. So here is a simple uh, condition, dominant Q. So uh, the question is, can we prove a situation where relying on a single Q is as good as any linear model that has the same Q and more? So if the weights, we have a situation here of five Qs, if the weights of n binary Qs or variables form a dominant Q structure, uh, then we can show that a single variable heuristic can never be outperformed in terms of predictive accuracy by any linear model. And the intuition is that if the weight of the first Q, the one the heuristic relates, yeah, is larger than the sum of the, all the others, then no logistic regression can reverse the judgment. So here is a simple condition that helps us to understand why simple can pay. And the more uh, that explains why no linear model can be better. It still doesn't explain how the heuristic can be better than a linear model. And that can be understood and also uh, used this in, a, in a, a short demonstration by the uh, bias variance dilemma. So the question, why simple heuristic is typically answered in the literature and in large parts of psychology and, and also behavioral economics by the so-called accuracy effort trade-off. So according to the thinking, a heuristic saves effort, but you pay by losing accuracy. That's a trade-off. You find this in uh, the standard literature. If you formalize that, the idea is the total error made is by bias and some noise. Noise means the irreducible part of that. Huh? So the heuristics and biases program assumes this hmm, wrongly hmm, and tries just to get rid of the bias. And the equation would be correct if you are in a world where there's no uncertainty except noise. Hmm. But it's not correct in a world that's not stable, in a world of uncertainty. And here the bias variance trade-off holds the total error is not only a function of bias and noise, but also of variance. Variance is, in statistical terms, is the, uh, so you have a population, you take lots of samples in order, and each of the samples gives you some estimates of your parameters, and that's the variance of the parameter estimates. Or more simply, assume there is, uh, so here are two dart boards. And the player on the left has a systematic bias. That is, all his darts are too far to the right and to, uh, to the bottom. But the player has a low variance. And the variance is the variance of the individual darts around its mean. The player on the right has no bias. On average, the darts are in the bullseye, but only on average, and the variability is high. This gives you an intuition that the question is not that you want an unbiased model. You want a model that has a good balance between bias. Bias is the difference between the bullseye and the average dart or the average sample estimate, uh, a good balance between the two. And, and it also shows you 
what simple heuristic or simple models do. They reduce the error from variance. So if a model has no free parameter as the recency heuristic, then there is no error from variance. Its estimates are not dependent on any sample. It will have bias and the bias may be large, but you just saw an example in that situation, ah, in that situation, uh, a one reason heuristic has no, has the same bias as any linear model. So we have situations where we can show that relying on one uh, reason can actually lead to better forecasts than relying on the same reason and many more. So that leads me to the Turkey illusion. The Turkey illusion is uh, <clears throat> the confusion between situations of uncertainty and situations where you can calculate the risk or where you can uh, actually use complex models. So it goes back to Bernard Russell, where the turkey was a chicken, and to Nassim Taleb and a few others. So why is it called turkey illusion? So imagine you are a turkey. It's the first day of your life. A man comes and you fear he might kill you, but he feeds you. On the second day of your life, the man comes again and you fear he might kill me. No, he feeds you. Third day of your life, same experience. According to Bayesian updating models and basically all typical models, the probability that the man will feed you and not kill you increases every day a bit. On day 100, it is it's higher than ever before, but it's the day before Thanksgiving and you're dead meat. The turkey missed an important piece of information. It was not in a stable situation or a situation of calculable risk. The turkey illusion is much more often committed by people and not by turkeys. And uh, the last financial crisis is a good example for that. Uh, in the time before the crisis, the estimates about volatility, about trustworthiness of the market and so on, they uh, increased. So the, the, um, the trustworthiness and volatility decreased and until uh, shortly before the <clears throat> The, the time the event happened and the type of models were exactly the same thing, betting on complexity, betting on stability, but it didn't happen. I work with the Bank of England on a program, Simple Heuristics for a Safer World of Finance. Finance is another domain where one tries to fight complexity with complex models. It hasn't worked. And the stable world principle tells you that it won't work, even if you make it more complex. You need to make it simpler. We need robust techniques to understand what's going on. And um, <clears throat> I start with a simple example from finance that illustrates the point. So assume you want to invest a certain amount of money in N assets. So that's the number n. And you uh, want to find the proper weighting. Harry Markowitz from the University of Chicago got his Nobel Prize for finding the solution. The solution is the mean variance model. And everyone who studies finance or business has been grown up. It's a standard probability model. So when Harry Markowitz invested his own money for the time of his retirement, we might think he used his Nobel Prize winning optimization model. No, he did not. He used a very simple heuristic that's called one over N. And again, we know from many psychological studies that people try 
to distribute equally when they do not know hmm, what could be best. Hmm? And uh, one over N just means allocate your money equally to each of the N funds. And studies have shown that in many situations, one over N makes more money according to standard measures such as sharp ratio than uh, mean variance or its modern Bayesian versions. The interesting question, however, is again one of ecological rationality. Can we find out what are the situations where one over N investing equally uh, pays and where complexity pays? We do not know the exact answer, but here are some general propositions. So if you are in a situation where there's low uncertainty to the left, few alternatives, just two or three things to invest, high amount of data, then go for complex solutions. That's the goal of optimization, big data, or mean variance in this case. But if you have high uncertainty, as in the stock market or in finance in general, many alternatives, small amount of data, go for simple solutions. That includes heuristics or here specifically one over N. And at the Bank of England, we are trying to develop models that help to make decisions that are more robust, that are not as volatile, uh, as the usual ways of, of decisions being made. And what I show you here is a third type of psychological heuristic that is being often used by ex experts. That's called a fast and frugal tree. A fast and frugal tree is a deliberately incomplete tree. And it's not pruned after the fact. It is designed in this way. A fast and frugal tree has a small number of questions or variables, here three. And it has exactly three plus one exits, or in general, if the number of uh, question is n, it has n plus one exit. And there's one exit on each of the questions. So it allows fast decisions, and it's frugal because it was only a few. And we test these trees, and the results so far show that they can deal with, can predict uh, banks who, who are vulnerable, who fail, uh, based on historical data, uh, better than the complex models. And even equally important is that they're transparent. Transparency is a value in particular in situations where, which have sensitive consequences, such as in uh, yeah, dealing with, with banks. And for instance, traditional models in finance, where banks calculate their value at risk in order to estimate the capital they need to have eh, to avoid getting bankrupt with a probability of something like, yeah, 99.9%. So a large bank would have to estimate thousands of risk parameters. And these parameters are not independent. So the bank would have to estimate millions of correlations or covariances and from a few years of data. And that borders on astrology. And many banks can use their own uh, risk models. And that uh, is one of the reasons why we might face another financial crisis. Transparency is the opposite. If transparency is implemented, then everyone can see what's going on. Banks will still try to uh, game uh, the, if that was, so for instance, this, this tree here, but the regulators can see easily 
versus being game. They have no chance to check millions of uh, correlations. The general point is hmm, we need to move into a world where we should make things as simple as possible, as Einstein said, not too simple, but always look whether we can replace a complex model by something more simple. At the moment, we are uh, moving in the, in my observation, in the opposite direction. People impress others with highly complex models. And I've witnessed many talks where I have no idea what this model actually is. But what is certain, the person who favors it has not tested it against a simple model. So here is one principle of forecasting methodology. You may call it principle number one. Always check whether there's a simple solution. And you uh, may be familiar with Rube Goldberg's inventions. And he has makes parodies about how you can uh, find complex solutions for a situation where the simple ones exist. And we also need to have the courage in order to respect what human psychology has achieved and at least test these heuristics that people use and test them against the complex model in which we so dearly believe. That brings me to the end of the talk. So I've talked today about psychological AI. Psychological AI is the approach where you start by looking, by studying carefully what experts do, how they solve, see, uh, solve problems, and then extract that, formalize it, turn it to an algorithm and test it, how good it really is. So that's, uh, one way to uh, realize Einstein's uh, recommendation, make it as simple as possible, but not too simple. But we are not doing just a statistic analysis. We're not doing a machine learning uh, thing and then pruning, but we start with theory at the beginning. And that can also help machine learning to, uh, to find other models for situations of uncertainty. I don't think that helps for situations uh, of extremely stable worlds like chess and go. And I've also talked about simplicity and transparency in protection. Uh, there are two values besides accuracy. Accuracy is some volatile result. Transparency is a value that we, uh, I think we will respect more and more, the more algorithms and proprietary algorithms are around that try to influence and manipulate us. So the stable world principle <clears throat> tells us when it's likely that a simple model will win and when it's likely that a complex model will win. It's a very general distinction that gives you a rough idea in stable situations like chess, like Go, where we are well defined, then go complex. In unstable situation, like predicting a flu or COVID or what people are doing, then you can bet that the complex models will overfit. They will just not do well. One needs to find a robust situation. And I have shown that one actually can prove situations where one reason is as good as the same reason on many others. So this is a, the study of ecological rationality is uh, the program to understand why uh, less is more effects can happen. Uh, I talked about the bias variance dilemma for machine learning, which makes clear that the, <clears throat> The goal is to uh, try to find a balance between the bias of a model 
and its error from variance, often called overfitting the past. And any complex model will overfit the past unless it's in a very stable world and has large data. Psychological AI is the original meaning of AI to use human heuristics to make computers smart. That's a situation where, um, uh, which I think is a real source of inspiration for models for forecasting that hasn't really been used. And I talked about the facing complexity and opacity, the mistaken belief that the most uh, accurate forecasting models must be inherently incomprehensible. And wherever you see a model that you don't understand, even if you try, be aware. Hmm? And uh, finally, I believe that a democratic society that's more and more populated by algorithm should insist in transparency and simplicity as far as it is possible and be aware of non-transparent forecasting models that cannot be scrutinized by scientific method. Simplicity, in contrast, enables transparency. And at the end, if you see a complex model that is not tested in a situation under uncertainty against the simple models, raise your hands and ask for it. So I hope that inspires you to think more and to trust more in the power of the evolved human brain as an inspiration for good forecasting models. Thank you for your attention. Professor Di Lorenzo, thank you so much for this exciting talk. Uh, we have a little bit more than five minutes uh, for questions and answers, please. Uh, please raise your hand if you wish, and uh, George and Tass will, uh, they may, they will make sure that they pass the microphone to you. Alternatively, uh, please uh, include your questions in the Q&A box, and indeed, we can make a start with that. Uh, Professor Gigerenzo, there is already a question for you there uh, about the fast and frugal trees examples and how the threshold values are actually defined. The question is, is the heuristic cast sounds as simple, presumably, as it sounds? Yeah, that's a very good question. I put the tree up again. Um, <clears throat> so, this tree is derived by what we call the practitioner's method. So we work, the practitioners are the economists at the Bank of England. And we work with them, we deliver the structure like a fast and frugal tree. And they deliver what the uh, important variables are. And the cutoffs are then estimated from data. So that's a combination between expert uh, judgment and systematic analysis. We also have tested uh, fast and frugal trees that are purely designed by statistical methods that are, also can be done. And uh, in that case, they weren't as good uh, compared to those, which one I show here, where the input is aided by the experts. There is a book um, by um, Katsikopoulos uh, et al. Uh, called uh, Classification in the Wild that came out last year, where the construction of fast and frugal trees is explained in detail. Classification in the Wild, that's MIT Press. Thank you. Uh, there is one more question in the q and I have a very interesting question, actually. Um, uh, the question is, PhD students usually do not get their work published if they do not suggest a bit more complex models. Uh, yeah. Would you suggest promoting a problem-oriented research program instead of a method-oriented one? Yeah, but look, this is kindergarten science. Huh? <laughs> if, you, if you do mindless rituals only to get something published. Now, if you are mediocre, you should do that. Yeah? But if you're smart, don't do that. Believe in science and help science to move on 
uh, over a, a mixture between. So why are these complex models there? It's uh, many reasons. Some people don't understand it. They just think that uh, complexity needs to be fought, fought by complexity. But there is also the other idea that's well known. You, you just use it in order to impress someone. I wouldn't call this science. That's more advertisement. And finally, marketing. You want to sell your models. And it, for instance, uh, the uh, take uh, one over n. So the example I gave for investment. I gave a talk uh, to Morningstar. And the um, <clears throat> and on one over n in simple investment methods. And then the head of uh, AXA Germany came to me and said afterwards, look, I'm going to test that. And two weeks later, he flew to Berlin to my office and said, we have looked at all our investments since 1969 and used one over n compared to the complex and expensive models we bought. And we have found that one over n with one over n, we would have made more money. And I'm now convinced about that. So they checked lots of rebalancing methods and other things. But then he asked Professor Gigerenzer, but how do we explain this to our customers? They may say, I can do that. So why do I need the complex models? And I told him, calm down. Yeah? There are still a number of questions to be solved. Yeah? How, how big should be in? What is the unit? Is it individual stocks or more? What's the rebalancing framework and so on? But you're right. Hmm? There is bluffing going on and also to the, the degree of dishonesty. And, but we need to have the courage to put in, to put in science and find out when simple works and when complex works and understand how this works. So uh, don't publish uh, things in which you not believe. You will regret it later in your life. Thank you. I, <clears throat> I cannot see, a uh, task George, uh, are there any people that have raised their hands? Or there's, should I continue? There's one here who's raised the hand, so I'll allow CK Leong to talk. One person. C.K. Leung, you have the floor. You should be able to talk. Uh, hi, hi. Yeah, thanks for an interesting talk. Uh, I just have a question. So yeah. will simple heuristic work well for long horizon forecasting where certainly the uncertainty is very high? Um, <clears throat> your question is whether simple heuristic work well if uncertainty is high? Yeah. Well, I mean, yeah. we we need to make a, a sort of comparison between uh, a one step ahead forecast and a many step ahead forecast, right? So for a many step ahead forecast, maybe uh, in many years later, uh, the uncertainty is very high. You agree with that? So I'm not sure whether simple heuristic work well in that kind of situation. So if I understand your question correctly, you're asking whether simple heuristic compared to complex models also work when they're not predicting just a week ahead, but maybe a year or two year ahead. That's, I think, is your question. Uh, uh, try it, test it. And you will find out, don't have prejudices. Yeah? And then you fall back. And I am always willing to, to do a bet with you. And I'm a usual win. Thank you. Uh, uh, right, it is already uh, uh, four o'clock, uh, excuse me, four o'clock in Athens, I'm afraid. So I, I think it's time now to draw proceedings uh, uh, to a close. Uh, on behalf of all of us, I would like to thank very much the audience for your attendance and your participation. And of course, I would like to thank once more uh, Professor Gideon Renzer for his time and truly inspiring talk. Thank you very much indeed. Before everybody goes, I would like to make one more uh, very short announcement, please. Uh, I think that George would like to show a slide to everybody, and this has to do with the student presentations. Uh, we would like very much to ask everybody to rate the presentations, please. I'm not sure, George, if you would like to show something of this is already sufficient. 
not, not to worry at all, George, not to worry at all. Uh, this is our case, the request, if everybody please uh, could uh, try to rate a student presentation. So, uh, Professor Gigerenzer, once more on behalf of all of us, thank you very much indeed for your time and for the very inspiring talk. Thank you very much. Thank you.